Hi, and thanks for joining us today for uh, strategies on implementing the next generation science standards. My name is Francis Bigent, and I'm the CEO here at NOADAM. Um, today we'll be taking a look at six key considerations as we're going about forming these uh, implementation strategies for this year for states that are uh, going for full implementation this year and for those who are going to be implementing over the next year to two years, things that we need to be thinking about in our curriculum, some of the differences between curriculum and instruction, and what these resources uh, look like. Just to give you a bit of background on myself, I'm a uh, former teacher. I spent a number of years in the classroom as a high school math teacher in uh, urban schools. And then at the elementary and middle school level, I was a STEM specialist, um, teaching kindergarten through sixth grade. And uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, test No Adam curriculum as well, so I can uh, help it speak from experience as to what practices and processes look like in the classroom. The first bit, though, to kind of start off here is maybe to think about why STEM. Science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, as we see it in the next generation science standards, uh, can lead students towards a science or engineering degree or career. But nationally, at least in the United States, uh, we're looking at about 4% of students uh, going on to become scientists or engineers and getting one of those degrees. Why is it that it's vital that all students learn science and engineering? And basically, it's the best environment for teaching higher order thinking skills, those creative, evaluative, and analytical thinking skills that are valuable for any career or college choice. And so when you think about next generation science standards and the kind of environment that we're going to be talking about uh, for the rest of our time together, putting students into the role of scientist and engineer gives them the opportunity to develop those skills in context, to create, evaluate, and analyze. And of course, that takes curriculum, uh, educators, materials, professional development, and all of those pieces. But that's the purpose. And so uh, what we're going to see here with the Next Generation Science Standards is really uh, we need to consider purpose and intentionality and really the connectedness of all of the parts of what's happening in the new Next Generation Science Standards within that classroom inquiry environment. So let's continue on here and take a look at the uh, six key areas we're going to cover and actually five points. So we're going to take a look at in the next 45 minutes or so how next generation inquiry resources are different. We're going to take a look at how next generation science standards redefine student teacher roles and then what makes something NGSS aligned. Um, practical milestones for the release responsibility and performance of next generation it, of students and also that next generation inquiry environment from a data and communication perspective. And again, uh, this is from our experience here at NOADAM and also uh, our research and working with these practices and processes through curriculum and in the classroom. And I'll be sharing you know, from my personal classroom experience as well. So let's jump right into it. Just as a foundation, it's important to realize that the Next Generation Science Standards really are based on this National Research Council, uh, National Academies, and National Institute of Health view of what science and engineering is. Scientists, from their viewpoint, ask questions, and they investigate those questions using experiments. So they're testing hypothetical answers to those questions. They're using the experiments to gather data, and they're using that data to reflect back on their proposed answer. And so scientists develop new scientific knowledge, so knowledge from experimentation. Engineers use that knowledge to s design solutions to problems. So engineers solve problems. And the way they do it is by prototyping technology, testing it, and then if it meets the need of the solves the problem, then that technology can be scaled. So engineers solve problems by designing technology. Scientists answer questions uh, by testing potential answers, gathering data, and producing new scientific knowledge, whether that answer is uh, supported or not supported by their experiment. And math is a tool of communication. So we can think of this really as a cycle, but it's also a, it's not just a cycle of concepts and how they connect, 
or disciplines and how they connect, but really it's a cycle of innovation. And that's why from a workforce development standpoint, it's vital, uh, again, whether you're a salesperson, whether you're a marketing person or a finance person, that you understand um, the connectedness and, and, and also have developed those critical thinking skills to be able to create, evaluate, and analyze to solve problems and answer questions in any context. So when we look at these new science standards, what we're seeing here is purpose. Everywhere within these next generation science standards, you'll find purpose. And so from, a, from the perspective of the standard itself, it's really a performance expectation. So the standard, is, its purpose is that students will be able to demonstrate it, demonstrate the performance expectation as a result of what they've experienced in the classroom. So this white area at the top, uh, right below where I've circled with the arrow, you have a performance expectation. That is the standard. It's what a student will be expected to demonstrate as a result of instruction. So why is this a key consideration for implementation? Well, when you consider the type of classroom environment that you're equipping, you have to think of how you equip it so that students are able to develop and use the three dimensions that you see below the standards in, as a context for learning and demonstrating that performance expectation. So the three boxes you see below the performance expectation are those three dimensions. So you have science and engineering practices, which are the skills dimension, disciplinary core ideas, which is sort of the content dimension, and then the cross-cutting concepts, which is really the uh, behavior or systems dimension, systems thinking dimension, that form the context where students will interact with, really engage with the content, access the content through skills that they're developing and practicing, and also observing the phenomenon and developing solutions uh, for themselves, hands-on or in some way that is um, really responsive from the perspective of science and engineering practices. And we'll take a look at what those are. So if a student is able to demonstrate understanding of that performance expectation, so in this case, develop a model to describe the movement of matter among plants, animals, decomposers, and the environment, then what they're doing is, is they are showing that they have mastered these related practices, so those skills, disciplinary core ideas, and cross-cutting concepts. And that's not to say that the performance expectation is a task. It's not. There's a difference between curriculum and standards. Standards are expectations of what a student uh, will be able to demonstrate. They've reached a specific mastery level. However, curriculum's job is to create these um, contexts in such a way that you're handling multiple standards in the same environment and students are engaging multiple practices and disciplinary core ideas and observing uh, dynamic behavior in context and personally. And so that's an intentional sort of nurturing process. That's a very key consideration right from the get-go when you're looking at the kind of resources and kind of training um, all of the different pieces that need to come together. Um, first and foremost, your team really needs to understand what these three dimensions are and the difference between curriculum and standards and what the difference is between a standard and a performance expectation. Why is that so relevant? Because we have a new definition of effective STEM instruction. And this is the National Research Council's definition from 2011. Effective STEM instruction capitalizes on students' early interest and experiences. It identifies and builds on what they know and provides them with experiences to engage them in the practices of science and engineering uh, and sustain their interest. And so this is very, very intentional language. You see, if we unpack this for a moment, by capitalizing on students' early interest and experiences, we're starting in pre-K. We're starting early, and that's intentional, and we're building. We're nurturing that student from pre-K all the way through grade 12. And in that nurturing process, we're specifically creating curriculum 
and this is again curriculum, not standards, curriculum that identifies and builds on what they know. So it's an intentional nurturing process, so scaffolding from September through June, and grade level specific as well, from pre-K through 12th grade. Within that curriculum and within that environment, what we're doing is we're creating that context, those three dimensions and those groups of uh, performance expectations sort of come alive. And so the students are experiencing them, but in a way that they're engaged with the practices. So it's not experiencing them through a video where they just sort of see something or going to a museum where they see something or they read something on the wall. But what they're actually doing is, is they're in the role of scientist or engineer using skills to access the content, to use it, to develop it, and so they may even be extending it in some sense. There, that is authentic, uh, it's purposeful, and it's engaging. And, it's, and in that environment, it's actually science and engineering. It's not learning about it, not about science, not about engineering, so it's not a sort of fact-based recall. We'll take a look at that in a second. And because the students are in that role with the mission, um, they are they're the center of instruction and their interest is being sustained over time, again, because it's uh, an art, a intentional articulation. So unpacking this, uh, another key consideration is to consider how these science instructional models are different. So a traditional model for science instruction, this is true whether we're talking about early elementary uh, elementary, middle school, high school, just because somebody has a specialist licensure doesn't mean that they are uh, necessarily engaging a different model. Because the traditional model for STEM instruction is this idea that there's content out there, which you see at the top, that content sort of flows through the teacher and the teacher focuses on distributing that to the students. And the way that traditional model of distribution works is through modeling facts, so the teacher you know, distributes the facts, they might demonstrate the phenomenon, and then explain what's going on to the student. And from the student's perspective in a traditional model, their performance is expected to really focus on recalling the facts, being able to repeat that demonstration, whether it's literally or sort of recalling it and what happened and why it happened, and to be able to summarize the phenomenon. That's the traditional model, and so you have this kind of loop. Um, and there's, there are limits to this, and I'm not going to go into it too deeply, but when the teacher has to distribute all of the content, um, it's the potential for the teacher uh, to become kind of a choke point where essentially they are regulating 30 different students in their class who have independent needs um, with sort of one model. Here's the demonstration. Everybody needs to pay attention. Everybody needs to think about this. Everybody needs to remember it. Everybody needs to be able to explain it. Um, and so the teacher then looks at their effectiveness through the lens of how well do the students recall the facts? How well can they repeat the demonstration or summarize the phenomenon? That's the traditional model. So what does a next generation model look like? What it looks like is Students developing st science and engineering or STEM practice skills, which are very well defined uh, within these next generation science standards, using those skills to access, to use and develop the content and the cross-cutting concepts. So the content is those disciplinary core ideas. And the teacher is uh, sort of helping uh, encourage the student along and so they're, and they're also uh, sort of uh, regulating that content and concept context. And so the teacher's role is really to tune the inquiry environment. And the way they do that is to gradually adjust the supports for the students. And that can be um, you know, in the way the level of intervention um, that they're having with any particular student or student team. Um, it could be sort of the depth of content that's being uh, focused on in the inquiry environment to help students uh, be able to engage appropriately, so understand what the expectations are of the, pra the STEM practices, and also the processes. Um, because the thing is, just like in an ELA context, the Next Generation Science Standards have these practice skills 
which really form the foundation of the engineering design process and the scientific process, or what we might traditionally call the scientific method. And I'm not going to get into that in depth. And the, the, the fact that there are practices uh, does not supplant the need for processes, because practices form processes. And processes do not mean that science and engineering are linear by any means. But what it means is that as you approach a question or a problem, that there are certain um, logical considerations. And so those processes help with that. In an ELA context, we have uh, ELA practices or writing practices like word choice, voice, sentence structure. Those practices help form or they're reflected in the writing process, things like brainstorming, drafting, pre-writing, peer review, revising, publishing. Okay? There's specific roles for the practices within these larger and distinct processes. So the teacher's job is really tuning the inquiry environment. So what is the student's job? Um, and this is uh, it's to demonstrate those expectations, the performance expectations, um, but also the expectations of the specific dimensions themselves. Because within an environment, within a next generation science environment, it's not learning a skill in isolation, learning a uh, piece of content in isolation, learning a cross-cutting concept in isolation. It's learning these uh, three dimensions together. So students are developing and using the content. They're using the STEM skills to solve problems and answer questions authentically and purposefully. And they are using a system behavior to understand and describe dynamic interactions in, in the content and what they're seeing and what they're doing as they solve the problems and uh, go about answering the questions uh, as scientists. When we think of purpose, there's many layers of purpose. So traditionally, I'm just going to skip ahead here a little bit, traditionally the, the, the purpose in a science classroom is um, disciplinary content, that idea of life science, physical science, earth science. Uh, if you're a state that has already engineering technologies and uh, applications of science or inquiry. That's what people see as sort of the purpose of what's going on. But in reality, especially under the Next Generation Science Standards, the purpose is first and foremost practice skills. So a student is developing the ability to ask questions, to find problems, develop and use models, not only carry out investigations, but plan them, construct evidence-based explanations and solutions for problems, engaging in argument from evidence. So, this is part of that inquiry context. It needs to be a key consideration that these practices are coming to life. And students are the ones at the helm that they're, they are engaging in the developing, in the planning, in the analyzing as scientists and engineers. They're doing that, of course, within the context of the discipline. So that's where we see earth science, life science, physical science, right? You take the skills and you apply them to the disciplines. You're observing as you're doing that, because you're a student acting as a scientist, acting as an engineer, the cross-cutting concepts, the patterns, cause and effect, the flow of energy and matter, structure and function, stability and change in systems, okay? Those things are coming to life in that environment. So when something comes to life, I think of it as three-dimensional. So it's an easy way, as you think of these three dimensions, to think of how the content with the cross-cutting concepts and the skills comes to life as a student demonstrates or practices first and demonstrates their understanding. From a common core perspective, if you're from a common core state, then you need to think of the connections also to common core math practices. And that's another purpose uh, for having uh, a next generation inquiry environment is you're, you're teaching across the curriculum in terms of math. So the math practices here closely mirror science and engineering practices. Students are making sense of problems and persevering. Reasoning abstractly, that's why they're planning first and then carrying out their plan. They're arguing from evidence and they're considering other people's arguments. They're using tools which aren't just sort of physical hammers and saws, but they're using tools which are operations, uh, looking for the mean, median, mode or a difference in an average. Um, and using that to support a claim. So they're making use of the structure, they're attending to precision, developing their own 
procedures that are not only precise, but efficient, so they're expressing regularity in that repeated reasoning. From an ELA standpoint, I'm just pulling out uh, a few middle school standards because it's kind of in the middle of everybody who's here. Thinking about that next generation science environment as not only supporting math, but also supporting ELA because students are uh, engaging in nonfiction reading, but they're also engaging in nonfiction writing. And they're doing that in a way that their plans are actually developing a nonfiction text, which is, again, uh, the kind of scientific or engineering text that you would use um, to be able to interact with that next generation content. And in doing so, you're, the students, when I say you, I'm talking about the students, um, are using evidence to support analysis. They are summarizing text and, and concepts distinct from their prior knowledge. Um, they're expressing information visually, and they're in their conclusion, they're distinguishing uh, clearly between facts, reason, judgment, and speculation. Um, the one I'm pulling up here, following precisely a multi-step procedure, I'm putting out there because when the students create it, that is science or engineering. When they follow it, that's ELA. And so classrooms that give students some kind of paint by number or follow this procedure, um, something where students are doing the multi-step procedure but not actually creating it, that's a key consideration because that is ELA but not science and not engineering under the next generation science standards. It's very important. Another key consideration here is the shift from lower order thinking, the remembering and understanding that we saw under that traditional model of science instruction, to higher order thinking where creating, evaluating, and analyzing happens simultaneously. Because within this inquiry environment, students have to not only remember and understand, but create, evaluate, analyze, and apply what they've discussed, what they've read, to actually use and develop skills, the content, and the sort of uh, systems thinking dimensions of the next generation science standards. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. But this is a, a major shift, because traditionally Bloom's taxonomy is remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating, sort of in a six-level pyramid. But you can't isolate uh, creating, evaluating, and analyzing in this inquiry environment. They need to be allowed to happen simultaneously. And you need to create the supports as an educator as you're tuning that environment to um, be engaging students in those higher order thinking skills at an appropriate level with a gradual release of responsibility. And that, that matters strategically because if you haven't you know, sort of taken the background that we've talked about so far into consideration, um, that's you know, sort of step one. Step two is as you're taking that into consideration, uh, you can't try to silo all these pieces and you can't try to silo the critical thinking aspect of it either. Um, because if you do, it all falls apart. Um, you need to release the responsibility and you need to give students an opportunity and actually really require them or set the expectations that they aren't just remembering, understanding, uh, and applying, but they're actually analyzing and creating and testing their creations and evaluating those tests and analyzing them and iterating in whatever this application is. So it requires the lower order thinking skills, uh, but they're insufficient really to be able to perform the expectations to demonstrate understanding. So in a classroom environment, this is what it kind of looks like. First, establishing background knowledge through nonfiction reading and having that uh, bring those disciplinary core ideas to life. And then uh, transitioning from that to activating learning through Socratic dialogue and connecting it to the students' experiences and really pushing them to begin not only understanding and applying, but analyzing and connecting, um, creating and evaluating with those concepts in, in the way that you ask questions um, and require their, their higher order thinking skills and move them from what they've learned or what they've basically read about, which is where traditional uh, sort of science learning models leave off, and 
push them to actually create within their answers and come to some type of problem or question, uh, whether that's individually or in small teams or as a group, where the students are released with responsibility, and really in small teams, to, to work with that problem or work with that question and begin planning an investigation. So if it's a question, we know that it's science. Um, so how are they going to go about um, answering that question? You know, what do they know about it? What's the research? The facts relevant to the question that they can pull? What's their hypothesis? What do they think is the hypothetical answer to that question? How can they test it? How can they gather, how can they structure a process to gather data relevant to be even being able to reflect on the hypothesis and understand if it is supported or not supported as an answer to the question? So the planning, that abstract, you know, uh, thinking abstractly happens in this planning phase. And the plan isn't just saying, okay, now it's time to plan your investigation. It's planning within the context of a process. Um, so that the plan is replicable, that it's clear, and, it's, and there's some logic to it. Um, and again, not to say that science is linear or engineering is linear, but, but it is logical. Um, so planning is key. And there are different processes for science than there are for engineering. They're very closely related, but they're different. And here's an example of what a plan would look like. And starting in fourth grade within our materials, uh, students use blank lab notebooks. And they're not note-taking. This isn't a plan that's put on the board. It's, it's, a, um, it's a process of going through and generating that nonfiction text where they go from a question and work through what they know about it, how they th what they think may be the answer, and how they might go about getting uh, an experiment together that would give them some data. What materials do they need? How would they carry out that procedure? What might that look like? And then they actually, you see here at the data phase, actually go out, carry out that experiment, and gather the data. And it's their data. See, this is all theirs. They own it because they are the scientist. They are the engineer. It doesn't mean that you're not helping to hold the expectations high and creating checkpoints. But it's a key consideration that students are moving to a level where there's a full release of responsibility that they can really carry out uh, they can apply their practice skills, but carry out science and engineering. So they're not they're they're developing skills relevant to participating in science and engineering by engaging their higher order thinking skills. So once they have that data, they form a conclusion, and this is what it looks like as they're carrying out their plan. Students engage with materials. Uh, oftentimes in small teams. And what's great about the small team or small group learning environment is that while students in that pair may need to agree on what the question, the hypothesis, or the uh, solution that they're going to prototype is, um, and their data is going to match, their team is going to be different than the other teams. And that little bit of variation creates a lot of opportunity for higher order thinking as we come to a time when there's debriefing. And so students carry out um, their investigation, their plan, uh, using their practice skills to access that co STEM content. And this is what these students are doing. Okay, And it, it happens not only in um, United States and suburban, urban, and rural environments, but also uh, abroad and in, and in places where circumstances are not ideal. So the picture you see on the screen here is students who are engaging with our materials actually in Arabic in IDP camps in the Kurdish region of northern Iraq. These are in UN High Council and refugee, uh, refugee camps, IDP camps. And so the behavior of the students and these practices and these processes, um, the disciplinary core ideas and the cross-cutting concepts can come to life in any environment. You don't need laboratories uh, with gas and water and all these crazy things coming out. Um, it's great if you have them, but you don't need them. What's key is that the students are engaging their thinking, that they're interacting with the materials, that they're working in small groups, and this is what it looks like. Okay. And as a result of that uh, creative process and that data gathering, whatever evidence is created needs to be analyzed. So students now are back analyzing their evidence and forming their conclusion conclusions which they present as they evaluate claims. See, this is a key consideration because 
in that that STEM inquiry environment, there's there's sort of different phases that you go through over and over and over again. Um, you don't have one plan um, where you you know you, it's sort of a culminating activity that you do once a trimester. Um, that's unfortunate if that's the way that your inquiry learning environment is structured, because these are skills just like uh, any other skill set that students need to practice over and over and over again, and they practice it in different contexts. So those those skills should be happening on a daily, weekly basis, and and in a way that's intentionally nurturing them. Um, and then going, of course, from things like nonfiction reading and dialogue to planning actually carrying out plans and then debriefing. And in the debrief time, it's an opportunity for students to kind of reflect back on their conclusions, compare them to other folks' conclusions, and then think about uh, you know, why their results are different, perhaps, than other students. Is it human error? Is it a different approach? Is it a different hypothesis? Um, that's key because, again, we are really focused now with the next generation science standards on skills and higher order thinking. Not so necessarily so that every student will become a scientist and engineer, but so that every student is equipped with higher order thinking skills to be able to understand science and engineering, but to be able to participate in supporting those industries, um, and also to be able to be trainable in any college or career choice that they make. Because higher order thinking skills make Train, you know, students' future trainable employees, and that's important for their opportunities. So we think about the kind of resources that are available right now. Um, there's not a lot of next generation science resources that are well made. Um, there's a lot of meatloaf, and what I mean by meatloaf is things that were something before that are not a whole lot different uh, than they were now under next generation science standards than they were uh, before next generation science standards. So let's put that aside for a moment and just think about the different levels of resources that are out there, um, whether they claim to be next generation or not. There are awareness ready resources which are aimed at helping students be aware of what science and engineering is. Um, Think about, again, that uh, trip to the museum. Museums are awareness-ready resources. They help connect students to an experience which makes them aware of what a scientist uh, is or does and things that they've created and what that looks like, um, what an engineer is. So if you ask a student, hey, you know, what's an engineer? They can raise their hand and say, oh, you know, engineers solve problems. They're aware of it doesn't mean that they are equipped to engage in problem solving. If you look at knowledge readiness, the kind of resources that are knowledge ready resources are things like textbooks. Textbooks are great at looking backward at what scientists and engineers have discovered or developed. They teach us all about the facts of science and the technology developed by engineers. But that is just knowledge about science and engineering. There's, again, uh, no skills yet. As we go towards performance readiness, we start to get towards the practices of science and engineering. And things like kits, um, a lot of common kits that have been around since the 70s or even uh, 60s, things like FOSS kits or STC kits or these little you know, uh, kits you can use to supplement uh, what you're doing, um, they're geared towards students understanding a specific phenomenon be able to answer a specific question. So think about it as rocks have different levels of hardness. And so there are rock and mineral kits. And they will teach students if you know, you're thinking about a rock, you can test its hardness by doing a hardness test and scratching it on different surfaces. So if you're asked how to determine the hardness of a rock or mineral, you know to do a rock or mineral hardness test, and that's how you do it. They're still not mastery ready, because under the next generation science standards, the focus is on skills that are useful for solving any problem or any question in many different contexts. 
And so those are skills specific to science and engineering. And when students have mastered those skills, those practices, um, they are mastery ready at that point. And so it's a key consideration uh, as you're going about your implementation strategy because as we see next generation science assessments emerging, uh, and over the next uh, 12 months, we're going to see more and more um, next generation science assessments emerging and standardized uh, assessment models emerging, which are really looking for students to be able to demonstrate those skills in any context. And I'll give you an example sort of along the lines of what we just spoke about. Imagine the context, or think of it as a scenario. When I'm saying context, I mean scenario. Think of the scenario of a contractor who's building a kitchen and needs to have a very durable countertop. And let's say that there are different materials he has to choose from in order to build that countertop. If, that's, if that is a scenario that's put to the student and we ask the student which, um, you know, to help the contractor decide which material is going to be most durable or most suitable for a countertop, that student needs to be able to look at that scenario, understand the question, and then be able to go from that question and use their science and engineering practice skills to take the question apart, to form a hypothesis, and to be able to test that hypothesis. And part of that may actually be to research or consider what durability is. Is it is it uh, the ability for the material to melt? Um, is it scratching? Is it uh, fracturing? Um, so the student's going to have to go through and decide on an approach and then actually create a procedure to then test different materials, gather data, and or look at data, and consider whether their hypothesis was supported or not supported by the data or, and form a conclusion. And so if um, they're forming a conclusion, they're doing it from the data. So you might imagine that a student's procedure would involve scratching the different materials in some kind of scratch test, or it might involve hitting the different materials to see if it fractures, or heating the different materials to see if it melts, depending on how they choose to frame durability. And so then they can report back based on the data they gathered as to how durable or whether these, you know, which material is most durable and which material the contractor uh, should consider. That is mastery. And so these next generation science assessments are going to be giving students scenarios. They're going to be asking students different levels of questions and, and requiring the students to unpack the scenario, apply their skills, work with the content, use the content and actually develop explanations, whether it's in the scientific context or whether it's in a problem-solving engineering context. Uh, and, and that is huge because if you're setting up your strategy uh, to implement these next generation science standards by not considering that as the goal, uh, skills mastery, then your classrooms are going to be in the old model of facts, remember the fact, repeat the fact, and students are never going to be getting out of those lower order thinking skills into the higher order thinking that they're going to need to perform well on those standardized assessments. And also, you know, not that the game, the end game is standardized assessments, but it's a ticket for them. Their performance is a ticket for them for opportunities, whether it's in a two-year program or in a job uh, right out of high school or in college. Uh, it's important. And it's important for life. So this is what it looks like. Um, so when you think about critical thinking in action, this is what it looks like. It looks like students in the role of scientist or engineer. In this case, these are fifth grade students in the role of engineer. Their class has done the nonfiction reading. They've had that dialogue. They've connected their personal experiences to it. And now they've broken up into their small teams, and they're taking the problem apart. They're going through that mastery sort of experience. and looking at the available materials and having to decide together on an approach that they're going to physically prototype here, test, gather the data, and then reflect on that prototype to decide if it solves the problem. And then they're going to present it to their peers. So this is key because 
if not every student in a row, in a seat, quiet, filling in a blank or, or circling something that's multiple choice. It's actually dynamic. And they're not copying from a board into a lab notebook. I don't like the word notebook because it sounds like note taking, which is copying. It's actually a lab text. It's a nonfiction text that these students are developing. Okay. And then if we think about that, it may seem kind of daunting. You know, fourth graders engaging in this um, exact sort of scenario. Below fourth grade, in our case, third grade, um, first grade, second grade, third grade, kindergarten, students are engaging in uh, more templated um, formats. So they don't have a completely blank lab notebook. Um, the reason is, is that developmentally, um, students aren't quite there for certain aspects of um, the processes, but they are there for the practices. And so what we can do is we can facilitate that gradual release of responsibility through a uh, thoughtful template, and it, it can still be purposeful and authentic and engaging all the right things. But starting in fourth grade, it's really that uh, full release of responsibility, but full release really f at the process level. So I want to take a look at what that release of responsibility looks like um, as we have been monitoring classes who engage in these sort of um, practices and processes that are next generation. So think about it, first of all, um, as a process or September through June. So students who, let's say they have those blank composition notebooks and they are, they're in that role um, of scientist or engineer, the first step, if we look in red down the bottom here, is to develop those STEM practice skills with the goal of independent proficiency with the practices. And remember, the practices make up they're the stuff of the processes. And so September through November, that's what's happening. And if you look to the left, the release stages that we're going through are guided shifting to collaborative in September, October, and then in October and November, we're moving from a collaborative model into really that full independent model. Okay, and students are still, you know, they're working in these small teams, hopefully, because that's a 21st century skill that's well documented. Uh, teamwork, collaboration. You don't see focus lessons here. The reason you don't see focus lessons is that the focus lessons really, in this context, should be guided. So it's a, a group think is really the maximum sort of hold that we have on student learning here, okay? And then it's really, it's interesting because it's, uh, it takes about 10 weeks scientifically for students or for anybody to form a habit. And so between September and November, that 10 week time period uh, goes through and we're able to reach that goal of independent, independent proficiency with practices because students really understand them now that we can shift our goal around Thanksgiving to refining uh, students' performance expectations. So within a process context, our goal is to develop independent proficiency with processes. So while the students are working in these groups, we expect them independently to have proficiency with the processes. Doesn't mean they're perfect, um, but our goal is that by mid-January that students are really able to um, gain proficiency at an independent level using those practices in context and actually answering questions or solving problems as scientists and engineers. And then in January, what we're doing is we are changing our focus to extending the students' performance expectations with the goal of really a much deeper expression of higher order thinking. So at the beginning of the year, students are going to kind of be clustered around similar ideas and similar approaches to things. By January, we're starting to push them to really think out of the box and try things differently. Okay, and that's a process that goes on January through June. And now it doesn't mean that the teacher isn't involved and when you're, there's a full release of responsibility that students just sort of like run and do it and at the end of the day, you know, they kind of turn something in which gets evaluated. What it means is, is that they are responsible for uh, being the scientist or engineer, but they're also reporting back at different milestones. And that's why you see here, um, you know, in something that's guided, we're thinking as a group, um, they're collaborating in their small groups. But then as it becomes independent, um, 
that release responsibility, we're having structured check-ins with students. So they're through a certain stage, they're coming back to check in. Um, and then that's our opportunity to redirect them individually or, or as a class. And so that's ongoing really um, in full force starting in de December but going through June. And you know, you modify this if you're starting in August or earlier, depending on uh, which community you're, community you're a part of. So what does that look like in terms of resources um, in order to make that happen, to be able to facilitate it? It's curriculum. It's curriculum that's grade level specific and that's nurturing that student understanding, engaging them in the practices, giving them those experiences, especially hands-on, to be able to be in that role of scientist or engineer. It's way beyond mapping. Um, it's actually the resources um, to understand, you know, what is that inquiry context that I'm creating as an educator. That's what curriculum is about. Professional development is a key component to be able to, uh, a key consideration in this, uh, you know, strategic approach to implementing the next generation science standards. How do you uh, map students existing, uh, not students, teachers existing skill set to the skill set that they need to be deploying in a next generation inquiry environment. So that takes professional development to understand what the curriculum means um, and what it's expecting of the teacher um, and what effective STEM instruction looks like. What, you know, what uh, is the construction of these next generation science standards. Professional development is key and should all connect. And then of course materials because students need to be interacting with the phenomenon. Um, creating, evaluating, and analyzing, and doing it in all these different contexts, um, not just in earth science, not just in life science. Um, they're engaging in all the different uh, disciplines. And that it's not fair to put that back on teachers. So strategically, if you want to implement the next generation science standards, um, you have to think about the curriculum, you have to think about the professional development, and you have to think about the materials required. Because if teachers are going out and getting these things on their own, um, your implementation is not going to be successful. Why? Well, it's a, a bit of an unreasonable expectation that teachers should spend their own money uh, to you know, make a classroom uh, function of, uh, effectively. Um, but beyond that, if a teacher doesn't elect to go out and spend all their free time buying materials or spending their own money, that becomes a whole in the student's performance because that affects effective STEM instruction. It affects student engagement um, and it affects continuity in your district or in your school uh, within the grade level and from grade to grade because students are going to be moving around with gaps, okay, where things are not being done with fidelity. And so those curriculum professional development material pieces um, make that STEM learning environment possible. And so you can see where I'm using uh, no atom as an example. So, you know, we have these pieces um, to make that happen, whether it's, you know, one, a one classroom school or a 200 or 500 classroom district. Um, but again, as you're looking at the other resources that are, are merging, these pieces have to be part of it to be successful. It's a key consideration. When you think about what even what you've learned today, uh, what we've discussed, and um, what's already going on in your district, strategically implementing your next generation science standards requires closed loop communication. What I mean by that is that teachers need to understand what the next generation science standards are, what a performance expectation is, what each of these three dimensions are, but then they also need to be communicating that amongst themselves and the students. So there's that connection between teachers and learners, and really teachers as learners. Um, but then there's also supporters, and those supporters are administrators. They are the different community organizations that may be involved in your school. They're parents, they're school board members. All of these key stakeholders who have a role in supporting the teachers in terms of the you know, what's required to have an effective uh, STEM environment, that effective instruction in their classroom. And sometimes that comes down to the time on learning required, basically. 
And then also the students. Uh, you know, you think of parents as the most obvious connection. If a parent is well educated um, by their teacher, by their district, about what they can do at home, um, what's expected of their student, then they are going to be reinforcing those expectations and again enhancing uh, teaching and learning. That closed loop communication is really key. Um, case in point, the Common Core standards for ELA and math have struggled tremendously because of the lack of closed loop communication. Um, and I don't want to get into um, debating Common Core ELA or Common Core Math and its validity or importance or whether it's better or worse than what we've had before. But I, what I would like to say is that Common Core standards are standards. Those standards are different than curriculum. And so what you commonly see is standards and then that those were implemented with poor strategy and when they were implemented, the resources did not reflect the standards. And so what happens is, is that a resource that is called a Common Core ELA reading program or math program has some confounded and you know, bizarre elements to it. And what happens is, is nobody understands that those, that those bizarre elements are somebody's bizarre interpretation of a common core standard. And so they show up at meetings angry, <laughs> or they're frustrated for a lack of effectiveness in their classroom, or they're confused because everybody's got a different idea as, as a student. Um, so that closed loop communication and really understanding the standards and then reflecting those standards in the curriculum appropriately and keeping that tight communication is absolutely key for strategic success. And what does that look like in the classroom? I'm going to save about 15 minutes here for questions. I will hang around. Um, the, in the classroom, this is an urban classroom with 75% um, high need students, 72, it's actually a school, 72% uh, low income, 35% English language. Uh, first language is not English and so on. Uh, over the course of two and a half years, using these types of practices and processes and equipping students for skills mastery, um, what's happened is that they've gone from 36% proficient to 87% proficient, which is approximately 50% above the state average. And this is the Lincoln Thompson Elementary School in Massachusetts on the uh, Massachusetts Common Assessment Program at grade five. Uh, it's unheard of in urban schools. And you get to see these double-digit gains, and in this case, dramatic double-digit gains, because when you empower teachers with the right resources, and you have that closed-loop communication, and you empower the students, put them in that role of scientist and engineer, then what you get is students who are, are masters, and they are able to take apart and answer any question in any context and solve any problem in any context. And again, what I'm saying, any, it's, it is any standards-based uh, context. And hopefully beyond that, but at least for proper uh, instructional purposes, it's, we're deriving from the standards. So that's an urban environment. We see the same sort of thing in a suburban environment. And I can show you other states too, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on mass right now. Um, this is not an urban environment, it's a very uh, wealthy suburban environment, uh, Manchester by the Sea, where um, their students went from you know, approximately 50% to again around 80% uh, advanced and proficient with those same practices and processes. And what it shows us is the kids are kids. It doesn't matter uh, that they're ELL students, it doesn't matter that uh, they're from low socioeconomics, if we empower them, if we um, equip our classrooms with strategically with the right resources, bring that uh, content alive. And also, I think in a case where you have English language learners and also students, um, special ed students, when we can move into multiple modalities the way that the next generation science standards allow us to, then we really um, give those students a great chance to shine. Uh, because they're not buried just in text, uh, they're conversational, they are hands-on, 
um, and they're actually demonstrating what they're learning. So that's why they're achieving, kids are kids, kids are achieving similar levels. And beyond 80%, it really, um, the way the current uh, tests are structured, it, kids just have to be spot on. And so at scale, you know, we get up into the 80s. Um, we have seen uh, schools up in the 90s, but 100% is uh, it's pretty tricky. This is a really low middle school. It was one of the bottom eight in Massachusetts. Um, so just to look at eighth grade data in the course from 2013 to 2014, they rose 19 points. Again, um, this is a community 97% uh, high needs. Um, and so actually we'll show it here. 97% high needs, 95% uh, low income, and so on, yet they can get these sort of gains. And the thing is, is it's, an, it's a step-by-step -step process, right? So I'd like to open up for questions on the right side of your screen. I appreciate your hanging in here. Uh, there's a lot of key considerations that we've been discussing um, that are important as we're forming our strategies. You're welcome to uh, throw some questions out. I'll do my best to answer them all, um, and I'll hang, over, I'll hang around an extra few minutes. If you, I'm not able to get to your question, you're welcome to reach out to me, Francis Vigent. Um, my email address is fvigent, V-I-G-E-A-N-T, at noadam.com, or you can give Mary Ellen a call. Uh, or email her and she will get things over to me. Um, while you're tossing your questions into the ring, I would like to let you know if um, you're looking for some samples, you can check out on noadam.com. There's a sample for each grade level of uh, the current version of NoAdam. Um, you're welcome to keep in touch as well. We post things on Facebook. Um, not just our own stuff, just things that are great resources um, to highlight in the classroom or also for professional development purposes. Um, you can also connect uh, via Twitter. Our handle is at noadam. And we uh, do publish articles from time to time on our blog, which is blog.noadam.com. Um, there are a limited number of curriculum pilots this year. I uh, believe middle school is happening this fall for folks. And by pilot, I mean, a lot of folks as um, different resources are out there, uh, it makes sense to uh, put resources in place for a year and um, feed your champions and see what that looks like. And so um, at an elementary level or at a middle school level, those resources are available um, from No Adam as well. I'm sure others um, will do that. The way to engage is uh, to contact Mary Ellen if you're interested. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these questions. We have questions here. One moment. Lots of questions. Will you be able to get a copy of the slides? Um, you will be able to get a copy of this recording. And uh, so it won't be the slides, but it will be sort of the slides with uh, my voice. But you can always mute me. So um, go ahead and, <laughs> and mute me if you wish, and you can always pause the screen. So I guess you get that sort of effect um, if you'd like. So what we'll do is after this uh, session, probably on Monday, you'll get a follow-up email with a link to the recording. And we'll throw some other helpful resources in there as well. Um, there are some resources developed by uh, Equip, which is sort of an NSTA, um, Achieve, and uh, other sort of consortium to be able to look at resources and um, any resources you have uh, to be able to understand uh, their alignment. We'll have that in there. And there's also, this is a piece in a series of webinars. So we have some other webinars if you're interested and we'll uh, give you some links to those which are not quite as um, this deep into things. Uh, they, they look at different aspects, so we'll include those as well. Let's see here. Is the Common Core more of just knowing information and NGSS more of performance proof they can do it? And the answer is no. <laughs> it's neither. What it is is it is, so next generation science standards is being able to demonstrate, to be able to have an understanding that you can demonstrate in context. So it requires information, but it requires performance proof, and it requires skills, 
and so that that what what it is that you need to know is dynamic um, and so there may be some facts in here but it's really the minority um, of what is required and the thing is again it's next generation science standards they're not common core um, it was a consortium of states that sort of uh, collaborated on this and then states are independently voting as to whether they adopt them or not so it's really it's not a federal thing it's not a common core thing uh, somebody asked is no atom like STC or FOSS as an inquiry based program um, that's a loaded question because FOSS and STC um, they give grade ranges they, you know, there's you have to supplement it. There's a lot of material you have to kind of figure out. You know, okay, what do I need to do to meet the needs? You know, from all this different stuff. Um, and they also are these large sort of, you know, you have a tote of materials that you're supposed to use over a large period of time, like three months. So most people will use one for, you know, one kit uh, for the first three months, the second kit for the third three months, and then for the final three months of school. A, a third kit, so it's sort of a three kit model. Um, no atom is very different. So no atom is inquiry-based, problem-based learning, and it's hands-on. But that's really where the comparison ends because it's all articulated um, in such a way that it's scaffolding. One unit scaffolds on the next. They're grade-specific units, and the unit order matters. And so what happens is, is a student is really on an odyssey from September through June in what um, science and engineering is and all, what all these different contexts are. So they're developing the knowledge, the content, but they're developing the skills, and they're using the skills to access that content. And they're doing it uh, you know, in an integrated sense. So, so that, um, I think, is a big departure. More questions. Someone asked, what grade level did I say that the last activity was? So I think you're probably referring to, and I'll show this to you again, uh, probably the students who were carrying out uh, this investigation here. And so these are students that would be probably around a, a fifth grade level. Um, carrying this out and so if you were to kind of get a snapshot of students kind of physically this is you know your fifth grader um, so that would be kind of that level a um, couple more questions here Okay. There are some kind of longer questions which I'm going to try to answer here, but if I don't um, get it all, please feel free again, send me an email and I will put that back on the screen and I'd be happy to answer that for you. My email's right up top there. Um, okay, so essentially, um, I'm interested in hearing how you have addressed the intent of the performance expectations. So um, in terms of integrating cross-cutting concepts and grade specific resources um, and addressing uh, performance expectations and so on and so forth, um, they're addressed within the, the investigations themselves. So. Um, if you think about an investigation where uh, part of the context involves different forms, sort of um, different uh, forms of rock, sedimentary, igneous, metamorphic rock, and we are going to be experimenting with their characteristics, um, we're also going to be relating those characteristics back to um, the cross-cutting concepts because, again, thinking in terms of uh, the behavior of rocks and minerals within the rock cycle and sort of the, um, the inputs and outputs of each of these sort of stages and how the rocks are transformed and how that transforms their properties. Um, so at a, at a very high level without spending a lot of time on this, um, what happens is the, the cross-cutting concepts 
are sort of integrated as a uh, you know as a characteristic of the phenomena and the context that we are developing and using, if that um, makes sense. And again, if I'm not answering your question completely, please feel free to email me. Um, Somebody asked, what is open loop communication? That's a great question. That's really when all these parties are not communicating, when there's breaks. That's an open loop. It's like a circuit that's open. An open circuit doesn't function well. Actually, doesn't function at all. <laughs> and so, um, so what happens is feedback does not get to the other players. So the other players don't really understand fully where they are in the process and you know, learn from the other players. Okay, so... Uh, that is open loop, um, and again, kind of back to that common core model. Um, you know, when there's open loop communications, and the you know the parents are showing up at the meetings with, you know, the assignment that really wasn't aligned to the common core, and saying, hey, look at these common core standards; they're crazy. Um, they don't really understand that it's a crazy interpretation, and then maybe that's also sh showing that there's a break in communication; that the loop is open between the standards and the educators or between the educator the the resource developer whether that's an educator or not and the standards um, folks and I think that's pretty common um, if, if you've been in education for any period of time I think that's something we see everywhere um, grab a couple more so long as we have people on the line I'll I'll kind of continue down this for another five or ten minutes to just answer these these really great questions, and um, I just want to make sure I'm doing them justice. So gauging alignment to the standards themselves, uh, equip rubric is what we use. Uh, we also use the standards, so it's really understanding by design and um, looking at alignment from the perspective of the. Um, Equip rubrics, uh, most recent versions, and um, looking at evidence statements as well. Um, you're welcome. I'm glad to hear this is helpful. <laughs> and let's see here. How can we discern whether resources are truly NGSS aligned? And I would recommend, and we'll send this resource to you, to use that latest Equip rubric and take a look. Um, because alignment really is around putting students into this role, really getting them involved with the phenomenon, developing and using the practices, um, and not doing things in isolation so that those three dimensions are really working together. So the content and the skills and the, the content and the cross-cutting concepts, and again, why I'm saying that the cross-cutting concepts are sort of infused here. Um, it's not in isolation. That's sort of an old model, and so um, that's pretty explicit in there as well. And, and the support structure and also the assessment structure um, is all needs to be aligned, uh, and so that's pointed out. So we'll send that resource along to you. Um, somebody is asking another question in here around California. And it says here, the California NGSS plan has caused issues with middle school teachers who want to continue with a disciplinary model. Um, how does No Adam's version of NGSS work in this model, and how does No Adam support the two models? So, um, so an NGSS model is a disciplinary model, but the thing is, is that it's not a disciplinary only model. And that is the common model I believe you're referring to where let's learn all about, and again about is what has been done by scientists or been done by engineers. Um, that isn't science. It's scientific knowledge. And so really it's kind of, it's, it's history. Um, it's the facts of the past of science and engineering. Um, NGSS says, you know, we need to know about uh, scientific knowledge and what scientists and engineers have done, but we need to be, we need to be using what we know uh, in a context where we observe the phenomenon, we reflect on it, 
and we uh, develop that understanding and that skill set and the phenomenon involves the discipline and it involves a cross-cutting concept. And so the disciplinary model survives, but it is now truly science and truly engineering. And so if people in California, as you're describing this, um, do not want students to engage in science and engineering or they do not want to teach science and engineering, um, then that's a problem. It's going to be a big issue. And so um, the strategy here that's key is to engage those educators in a dialogue about what science and engineering really is. Not my definition, not your definition, but really the definition that's come all the way from the experts, from the National Research Council, from the National Academies, from the Institutes of Health, and has permeated these next generation science standards in such a way um, that we now have a clear definition. And you know that, that has taken a lot of thoughtful effort on the behalf of the NGSS partner states um, and the National Research Council to give us that. And it's something that's really been the Achilles heel of most state-specific standards to this point. Science and engineering has not been well defined so that you could actually get away with a discipline-only, backward-looking, knowledge-centric uh, model of instruction. And it just doesn't fly anymore because innovation is fueled by answering questions and solving problems through the use of experimentation, the development of data, and supporting uh, claims or cons the, the validity of hypotheses or so potential solution uh, prototypes uh, with that data. And so um, that's why, you know, that's why it's science, that's why it's engineering. Um, it's kind of it's kind of the equivalent of learning about riding a bike with never really riding a bike, to take that sort of fact centric uh, model. Somebody else is asking about costs and uh, grants in here. Um, you know, cost is something that really depends on the you know if you're a rural school or district versus an urban district versus a uh, suburban district. And the reason I say that is class size varies. So when you're dealing with anything that involves materials and all of that, um, it depends on your, you know, no, it's not one size fits all, um, your community and, um, you know, whether you're using an, a, a self-contained model or a specialist model um, and how many sections and things like this. So the best thing to do if you have uh, questions around costs and stuff like that, uh, contact Mary Ellen, send her an email, or if you want to reach out to me, I'll get you to the right person who can try to answer some of those things. Um, but the reality is, is yeah, you know, and it, anytime there's a change of standards, it costs money um, because you need to do things differently. You need to convene people for discussions. You need to train people. Um, you need curriculum and resources, materials to carry that uh, improve, you know, newer model of instruction out. And that's just how it is. Um, if you don't budget for it, then you're going to always be at a loss, just the way that you would be with ELA or math. Uh, in terms of grants, uh, we don't have grants, but what we do is uh, we do have a grant section on our website. And um, I like to believe that's pretty well laid out. And um, if you have a local grant organization, a PTO committee, uh, a company in your region that offers grants, whether they're STEM uh, grants or just grants for teachers to be able to test or seed uh, new programming um, or curriculum resources or materials. Um, take a look at that grants page. Um, it helps to clarify. And we're always happy if you're if you're looking at grants to uh, implement no atom. Um, to be able to help you in that process as best we can. We'll offer a peer review, um, get you whatever numbers you need, um, and also any resources to be able to communicate uh, what it is you're trying to pilot or, um, or implement. So with that, I'm going to let you all go. If I wasn't able to get to your question, um, I'm sorry. Please email me, and I will do the best that I can um, to get back to you. And um, we'll do the best we can. There is one specific question here that um, I think um, worth, is worth mentioning because assessment is, um, is something I do want to talk about. Assessment is 
something that happens formatively and summatively. You have your traditional assessments in the sense of vocabulary, um, and you have to sort of consider how that occurs. But there's also conceptual assessments. So, you know, what we're talking about the labs, those are summative assessments in terms of where sc students are at in being able to demonstrate their understanding, uh, being able to demonstrate that performance and expectation. Also, how well they have mastered those three dimensions at any given time. So that's the first piece. Lab notebooks are a, a summative assessment, but they're also formative because you create focus correction areas, and that's the strategy here, um, where you are tuning those students' performance uh, and your expectations of those performance as you go through the year. Okay, And so you're not taking home these giant labs and giant rubrics and you know spending every waking minute trying to make that happen with some kind of a letter grade. What you're doing is you are uh, dipsticking at those checkpoints that we mentioned earlier and then uh, you're creating focus correction areas that you are grading. You know whether you use a letter grade or a check process um, that's very community specific. People have very specific uh, philosophies on whether letter grades are appropriate in any discipline um, but uh, the bottom line is, is that's what you're grading. You're grading the student's uh, proficiency in those three dimensions and in those performance expectations. And that's how it manifests itself in lab notebooks, in vocabulary assessments, and also in concept assessments where you would look at something and um, challenge the students to synthesize in a new scenario or in a new environment um, with the skills and the performance, you basically demonstrate that performance expectation in a new context. Um, and that's all part of our resources. It really should be part of anyone else's resources as well. Um, but that's there. And you know, there's so much opportunity to assess that you can over-assess students as well. So that's something to be mindful of. Um, there's a question here about uh, Project Lead the Way. Um, you know, I don't know enough to say uh, whether it um, fits with NGSS or not. Uh, that's really for you to assess using the Equip rubric, um, the Next Generation Science Standards. What I can say is, is um, you know, my what I do know of, of Project Lead the Way is it's a pre-engineering program, and so um, the Next Generation Science Standards are really looking at the full cycle and uh, both science and engineering, and specifically viewing engineering as an application of science and technology. Um, so there is some differentiation here as well from sort of the, uh, the tech literacy standards that are out there. No one has asked a question about that, but tech literacy standards have a focus on sort of technological fluency and a student's ability to engage technology, you know, specific platforms. Um, so you might say, you know, computer use. Um, and you know word processing, and you know, but there's there's higher levels of this sort of thing as, as well. Not a part of the next generation science standards. The next generation science standards are focusing on the skills, the disciplines, and the systems that a student needs to master in order to participate in developing technology. And so they're more timeless, I would say, whereas tech standards are more subject to evolution. And the reason is that uh, technology evolves, right? So students are far more proficient these days with uh, computer skills than they were 20 years ago. Um, but that just means that the techno technological literacy standards of tomorrow are going to necessarily evolve. OK, so that is all the time we have uh, for. Um, again, email me if I haven't gotten to your question. I really appreciate your time. Um, I've had a lot of fun, and I uh, really enjoy your thoughtful questions. And um, please uh, join us again for another webinar uh, and share the recording of this one uh, when we get it. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, and good afternoon.